Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this hearing of the Budget and Finance Committee for Monday, August 11th, 2014. I'm Paul Krikorian, Chair of the Committee, and I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Council Members Mitchell Englander and Bob Blumenfield, and we are ready to begin. Um, anyone wishing to offer public comment should please fill out a white public comment card and bring it forward. So far we have uh, no cards either about uh, agenda items or about uh, general matters within the committee's jurisdiction. Um, we're going to defer our closed session items until the end of the agenda because the rest of our agenda is so brief. So hopefully we can get that uh, banged out. Members, I would uh, recommend item four as a consent approval candidate. Uh, it's a city attorney report, the usual liability uh, re account report that we get. And so unless there's questions or concerns about that, we can dispose of it. I think consent. About it. All right. Very good. Then uh, we'll go ahead and take, uh, well, why don't we take them in order? Let's go ahead and take item number three first, and then we'll come back to item four. Item number three is the City Administrative Officer and City Attorney Reports authorizing resolutions and ordinances relative to requesting authority to issue up to 200, 200 million in Municipal Improvement Corporation of Los Angeles, MICLA, Fixed Rate Lease Revenue Bonds, Series 2014, Series 2014A, and Series uh, Refunding Series 2014B. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hato from the CEO Office. Um, the CEO requests um, authority to issue up to 200 million in MIGLA lease revenue bonds um, to refinance outstanding commercial paper notes that were used to um, acquire equipment and to make improvements to certain um, city facilities and also to refund uh, MIGLA outstanding debt of approximately 51.2 million. Um, those bonds are the 2002 AT bonds, the 2003 AV, and the 2003 AW. Um, the bonds will be issued in three series. Um, the first series will be the equipment series, which is the 2014. Um, this will be issued as a private placement. That means um, a financial institution will purchase the bonds directly. Um, we are working with Bank of America Public Capital Corporation with this uh, private placement. We issued an RFP um, when we went out, and Bank of America provided a option to purchase the, the, the bonds directly at rates lower than current market conditions. Um, so we want to take advantage of this offer. We will continue to monitor um, interest rates to make sure that the city receives the best rate. In the event that the private placement does not work out, we can transition into a public offering. Um, but we'll continue to monitor that. Um, what, what would be, two, sorry, sorry, what would be the advantage to Bank of America in offering rates below market rates? Um, What's in it for them? The interest. They, they receive the interest. Um, but why would they negotiate something below market rate is what I'm getting at. Is that, does that imply a projecting further interest rate declines into the future? Or what, why would they do that? No, actually, um, everyone out there things that interest rate will climb, climb eventually because interest rates are so low. This is part of their inventory, um, things they need to invest in, and they believe that this is a good product to invest in. Okay. And the other two series um, will be the real property series and the refunding series. It will be issued on a negotiated basis uh, as a public offering. The refunding bonds um, that I mentioned earlier, the 2000, uh, that we plan to refund, 2002 AT, AV, and AW, would generate about $9.7 in interest savings over the life of the bonds. The issuance of these bonds will be an obligation of the general fund. Um, the fiscal year 2014-15 debt service uh, for these bonds have already been budgeted in the capital finance fund. Uh, we anticipate to sell the bonds um, in September 2014 for the public offering, and we um, expect to complete the private placement in October 2014. And um, also because Series AT and AV were bonds that were issued to finance um, capital improvements at the Central Library, we have to go to the um, Library Commission Board 
and that's anticipated for August 28th. Um, we request that council hears this item soon after August 28th. Okay, great. It's terrific to realize interest savings, so uh, bravo on that. These, all of these transactions are standard, straightforward, long-term refinancings. There's no interest rate swaps or anything uh, unconventional like that in any of this, correct? Correct. This is traditional, um, very vanilla. This is what this is the process for our MIGLA debt. Uh, we usually issue commercial paper to acquire equipment and um, um, capital improvements, and then we uh, do a take what we call a takeout from short-term debt into longer-term debt, and this is like exactly what we're doing. Great, members, Mr. Blumenfield. Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds sounds like a great deal. Seems to make a lot of sense, um, but in, in light of the the conversation about the interest rate swaps and and how some things get characterized, well, maybe it's good in the short term, but potentially down the road, long term. Is there any? Um, long-term liability that's part of this, or is there any inflexibility that's, that's built into this that we may, you know, in the future want to have more flexibility on? Um, for, the, for this transaction, for this make transaction, this is a fixed rate deal, so there won't be any um, adjustments to interest rate. It's fixed. Unlike swaps where interest rates may change, it's more variable. So the only way this would be a bad deal is if, if the rates go lower than the current fixed rate. For this deal, is a fixed rate, so you don't have those issues of um, variable rate debt. And, uh, I wouldn't necessarily characterize it as, as a bad deal if interest rates go down because we don't know what the interest rates will be in a month from now or two months from now. It's it's the best deal that's currently the market will will dictate. So it's it's based on the conditions we know today. And you make every every economic decision is that way and you can't you can't make your decisions in hindsight in five mm -hmm. years from now. You have to decide what is the best deal moving forward. But it's just sort of putting it out there in advance, what are the you know how could we lose in this deal theoretically and that's you know, if if the markets change in five years from now, and we're fixed in on one rate, we could have had a, a better rate. Then, in hindsight, we would have done better had we not done this. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do this. And it sounds like we're, we're refinancing. We're getting money out of this. I just sort of I, I want to make sure that we're upfront about all of these things in light of our conversation uh, last session, where we did we did look at a deal and say, in hindsight, maybe we could have done something differently. But I'm reading what I'm reading. It, it seems like a good deal to me. So. Okay. Mr. Anderson, anything on this? All right. Um, if there's no objection, then the action of the committee will be to approve the CAO's report and recommendations. So, Thank you. Thank you very much. And for clarification, Mr. Chair, there are also ordinances with that matter. Are you recommending approval of those ordinances to implement the action? Well, yes, if that's not implied by the approval of the recommendations, then thank certainly you. we'll so specify. Uh, all right, thank you. That brings us to item number four. Item number four, the city attorney report relative to the status of liability accounts as of March 31st, 2014. Um, Tom Peters from our office. We had, had to pull him out of a meeting, so he, he's not here right now. If you could put this over till after the closed session, or I could sure. I could convey your inquiries, and it could be uh, answered when it gets to council on Wednesday. Do you want to do you want to try to take a stab at it, or Mr. Yeah, Bloomingfield? I don't know how much detail you want. No, it wasn't much. Detail. I mean, I basically wanted to sort of wanted to understand how this trends compared with, with previous years in terms of our liability. Uh, we're looking at the the amount of liability, and and obviously, all of us are putting pressure on on. City Attorney's Office to, to work on limiting our liabilities as much as possible, so to understand how that fits in the trend and how it uh, relates to other big cases that are out there, like the Willits case. Um, I don't think that's reflected in, in these numbers. Um, and to understand what other big cases might be in the pipeline that would also impact this liability, if that's something that we can discuss openly, I don't know. But that's. So, so that was the line of thinking I had when reading these. Okay. I want to get a better sense. Then I, I could convey those 
inquiries to uh, Tom, and we can report back to you. Well, why don't we go ahead and when do you think he'll be done and available? Hope, hopefully within the next 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Well, then why don't we just, if you can convey those to him, and then we'll bring it back okay. at the conclusion of closed session. Maybe we can just get it all resolved right Okay. Now. Right. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. None of these questions are things that should hold up the item. They're more spurred by the item. Very good. Uh, all right. Uh, anything else on that, Mr. Englander? Um, no. Okay. Then, uh, before we go into closed session, is there anybody wishing to offer uh, public comment on items one or two? Seeing none, uh, comment on those items is closed. Is there anyone wishing to offer general public comment to the committee? Seeing none, general public comment is closed. Um, so with that, we will retire to closed session for consideration of items number one and two. We'll start, we'll start with, unless the city attorney has a preference as to priority, we'll just go one first and then two. Number four. Item four for further consideration and responses to uh, members' questions. I can ask the city attorney back up. Good afternoon. Tom Peters. I'm the chief of the civil branch. Good afternoon. And Mr. Blumenfield, this is, uh, we're returning to item number four. Um, you had a number of uh, questions, I think, that have already been presented to the city attorney. I don't know if those have been conveyed. Did you represent the questions, or did you get the questions already? Uh, it'd, be, it'd be better if you reframed them. Okay. You basically want to know how, how this trend compares with previous years. We're obviously all pulling for working on our liabilities and, and getting that trend line to go down, uh, how the Willits case fits into this and other big cases that may or may not be included in this that are out there in the universe that we might want to know about as well. Uh, mindful that we are in open session, let me, uh, council member, uh, address it this way. As obviously what can be appropriate. Yeah. Even though we have quite a number of cases, hundreds and hundreds of cases at any given time, the outlier case uh, can torpedo a budget, and it's really difficult to predict where that outlier case will come from. I will tell you, because it would be publicly available, that a claim was recently filed, as an example, claiming that for a period of time, one of our parking garages at Pershing Square was recording not five digits of a credit card, but 10. Turns out there's a federal statute that says that in the event that an entity, including a governmental entity, willfully, that's the key, willfully records more than five digits of a credit card, puts it on a receipt, the, uh, the court must impose a fine of $100 to $1,000 per violation. There's 167,000 such transactions. So you can imagine, I'm extraordinarily confident case is defensive. Um, that's all I'll say specifically about it. But that gives you an example of how things can come up that would really vastly affect, you know, consume multiples of, of the budget, worst case scenario, which I commit to you will not occur. Um, but that said, generally the trend has been increased exposure and liability. One of the drivers I predict will be the Chaudhry case. The Chaudhry case, this is apropos of your recent discussion, um, in closed session, the Chaudhry case now allows an item of damages to be recovered in police misconduct cases that formerly was not recoverable. And that is the conscious pain and suffering of the decedent prior to death. That's a whole, and imagine how you would quantify that. It's very difficult to imagine. But the point is, that's another entire category of damages that now, assuming there's no en banc review or, or, or certiorari is granted in that case, we're petitioning for cert. Um, if that's not, if search not granted, that remains the law of the Ninth Circuit. Now we have a new category of damages that, when we're hit in a police, well, a category was with the a category of damages, conscious pain and suffering of the deceased prior to death. Imagine hypothetically a shooting, and the individual who shot uh, lives for any period of time, and the plaintiff will be entitled to arg argue under the charge case that the pain and suffering felt by the decedent prior to his or her dying is a compensable, recoverable area of damages. In state court, in a standard vehicular accident, for instance, where there's a wrongful death, the conscious pain and suffering of the decedent dies with him or her. 
the estate, the survivors, the family members cannot recover, not anymore in Section 1983 cases. That's just pressure that I predict will, on the average, over a large swath of cases, tend to inflate the value of 1983 cases beyond what they've been. And as you know, we have quite a number of those. So you know, it's a, it's a long-winded way of saying I think that the pressure will remain upward, um, probably, though, not much greater than inflation, which isn't particularly acute right now. Uh, I think we've got a pretty good handle on keeping it within the range. So, so this year is higher than last year was higher than the year before? Yes. Well, if you graph them, we'll have something, for instance, Rampart that will will come and will drive it higher for a period of time until you work through those categories of cases. I do not see a category of cases like that. We have Willits. We have ADA sidewalk kinds of cases where I can tell you the demands. I think I can tell you this. Well, I'll just say 10 figure kind of demands over 30 years. Right. Who knows where that goes? 10, 10 figures, okay? Um, we're very actively defending and negotiating in those matters. That would be a, an interesting and useful graphic to have in terms of, I can uh, the, of the past it should be all publicly. Yeah, my colleague um, Gary Geist does have those graphs, and I will get from him and be happy to send them to all of you if you'd like to see them. I think they go back about six years. And is there a, um, we're trying to get a, a handle on the liabilities this year, which, as you're saying, will be slightly li larger than the previous year with these outliers that are out there. Um, is it useful for, I mean, it, getting a list of some of those outliers, I'm assuming that we can get that would be useful also, just so we have a sense of what is, you know, I, I know the Willits case. I don't know all the other cases, but what are those outliers that are out there? Um, probably only a handful, right? Part of the problem with the outlier, not to be sort of sarcastic, is they're outliers. I don't know where they are. You can get a runaway verdict in a certain case that you thought was going to be brought in at X, and it's a multiple, maybe two orders of magnitude higher. So leaving those to the side, which often you can address um, in the courts of appeal. Would you benefit from my estimation of what cases have an exposure of over X, be it 10 million, be it 40? You tell me, and I'd be happy to get that to you. Maybe we talk about it in closed session. Council member, um, as part of uh, actual disclosure that we do with, uh, with any bond issuance, in working with the city attorney, we put together in our appendix A, which is actually was part of the Mickler report, part of the, the bigger package, um, a listing of all lawsuits and uh, again working with the city attorney with the, the uh, we try to get to a number where they think could be kind of those um, those potential impacts for example so, and some of those are on the upper upper side of uh, potential liability for example with the Ardon case for a number of years we we're reporting a possible liability of 750 million dollars just because that was a total amount for the TUT tax over the duration of uh, the exposure that we had for three years. Uh, now it's come down under, I believe, 300 or around $300 million. Still a higher amount, but in working with the city attorney, uh, an amount that's less, obviously, than the 750 that was reporting. But it's a, it's a document that's out there. Uh, we definitely can provide it to you um, that, that shows kind of what's been made public as far as the cases and those, those potential amounts. Well, that, that would be useful. You know, part, this is really just a way to for me to get my head around as we keep trying to learn more about our budget and what our you know, assets and liabilities are to better understand what that is. So I look forward to seeing the graph and seeing that, that sure. chart. And Mr. We Chair, I'm, I'm happy to move forward with the, uh, with the item. Mr. Chair. Minister, uh, do anything for them? Then, uh, with that, if we're, um, if there's no objection, we'll go ahead and approve. Uh, what, what actually do we do? We're receiving and filing, noting and filing, noting and filing the report. And uh, thank you for thank you, staying and for coming back to respond to the questions. Thank you. All right. Is there any other item before the committee? Seeing nothing, nothing further, we are adjourned.